I won't let a low educated man like you date my daughter. A part time high school. Are you kidding me? I've heard enough about your struggles growing up in a single parent household. Why don't you just get lost? You're an eyesore. The man in front of me abruptly stood up, grabbed his cup, and splashed its lukewarm contents on me. It wasn't hot enough to burn, but it tore apart the last shreds of my pride. I'm truly sorry. Somehow mistering those words, I pushed myself and staggered out of the room. She didn't follow me. Filled with this bitterness, I dedicated myself wholeheartedly to working harder. Years later, when I ran into my now father-in-law, who was an attorney, I could have never predicted what would unfold. This is the story of my life's turnaround. My name's Matthew. Currently, I work as a clerk at a law firm. Due to personal circumstances at home, I graduated from a part-time high school and was hired straight from my part-time job into this law firm. The boss, who knew about my situation, kindly employed me since I had been working part-time there since high school. I owe so much to the boss for taking in someone like me with just a high school diploma and no significant skills. Now, I'm learning various things while working. I'm doing my best to gain skills to be of help to the boss. I come from a single mother household, and I have a younger brother and sister. I hardly remember my father, but I believe he was a violent man when he drank. He was rarely home and was mostly out drinking, so as a young child, I didn't really know him. My brother and sister probably felt the same. There was a time when my father went on a rampage, and fearing for our safety, we fled our home. From then on, the four of us began living in a small apartment. In hindsight, I guess that's when my parents divorced. We settled in our current place after taking several train rides from our old home. The climate here is mild, and it rarely snows heavily during the winter. Given that my mother had a fragile constitution and often fell, this pleasant climate might have been comforting for her. After graduating middle school, I enrolled in a part-time high school to help with household expenses and took on numerous part-time jobs. I worked at places like convenience stores, gas stations, coffee shops, and even did some manual labor like road construction. Whenever I heard of a job opportunity, I jumped on it and jiggled multiple jobs. One of those jobs was doing odd jobs at this law firm. While my tasks, such as affixing stamps to mail, organizing documents, and sorting printed materials, were fairly simple, the hourly wage was good and all the colleagues were just wonderful people. Because of this, I truly enjoyed my job and worked hard every day. After high school, I landed a job as a clerk. It was such a blessing. Another unforgettable job I had was at a tea room. It was a quaint little place run by a friend's uncle and boasted an array of teas, making it a hidden gem in the community. The owner's wife, known for her simple homemade baked goods, had an especially popular item, cookies that both my younger brother and sister couldn't get enough of. And in that tea room, I had a destiny-driven encounter. Her name was Alicia. She was my age, a petite girl. Her long black hair was tied back, swaying like a tail when she moved something I found endearing. With a gentle war around her, her calm manner of speaking and radiant smile was downright charming. Her passion for tea was evident, as she could talk endlessly about her favorites. I found that side of her so cute. I quickly fell for Alicia. Turns out, she had a soft spot for me too, and soon after, we started dating. For both of us, it was our first relationship, our first dates, our first time holding hands. We slowly but surely deepened our bond. Upon graduating high school, I secured a job at a law firm and had to leave my part-time job. Alicia, however, continued to work there while attending a local college. Every time I drop by the tea room after work, she greets me with a freshly brewed cup of tea. It became a daily routine for me to escort her to the train station after her shift. 
she secured a job in the spring of our fourth year together. With both of us stepping into the working world, I proposed to Alicia. My younger siblings had started high school, and my mom found steady work. Our home life was stabilizing, and I started to think about the future. When Alicia accepted my proposal, I was so overwhelmed with joy I broke down in tears. It felt too good to be true, almost frighteningly so. But our bliss was soon to be tested. Alicia came from what you might call an old money family, with a lineage of politicians and lawyers. Her grandfather had been a city councilman, and her father was a lawyer. Being the only child, she was doted upon. I was taken aback when I found out about her family's prominence, but she reassured me with a laugh, saying it wasn't a big deal. My folks are just overprotective and tend to spoil me. They wouldn't object to anyone I chose to be with. It seems that she talked about me quite often to her folks. Feeling a touch of anxiety, I was heading to her parents' place, even though she assures me it's okay, telling me with sparkling eyes that they always listen with smiles on their faces. Her residence was a large, traditional-style home, enclosed by a grand fence in a quiet suburban neighborhood. Though I'd always dropped her off at the train station, I'd never seen her house before. She'd always turned down my offers to take her home, saying that a car was already coming to pick her up from the station. Seeing the splendor of her house made me reflect on the small apartment I shared with my family. I couldn't help but feel our worlds were so different, intensifying my anxiety. It's old and a bit embarrassing. Seeing that, she walked through the gate, but all I could do was shake my head. The person who greeted me was her mother. Her gentle and warm smile was so much like Alicia's that I could definitely see the family resemblance. My name's Matthew. Nice to meet you. As I bowed and introduced myself, her mother smiled softly and led the way. My husband will be a bit late from work. I hope you don't mind waiting for a bit. Oh, it's all right. I was led to a traditional living room adorned with beautiful American paintings and what looked like an expensive vase. She served tea for us. The atmosphere around Alicia and her mother was so similar, both radiated a calm and gentle aura. Suddenly, the sliding door opened and a stern-looking man walked in. Without saying a word, he took a seat next to the mother. From the way she served him tea without any introduction, I deduced he must be her father. Um, hello, my name's Matthew. I straightened my back and bowed deeply. However, he just glanced at me and didn't say a word. Confused, I looked at Alicia and she seemed equally bewildered, shifting her gaze between her father and me. Amid the silence, the first to speak up was the mother. Matthew, please look up. Honey, what's going on? Trying to mediate the situation, the mother raised her hand to intervene, but the father began to speak. Was it Matthew? Alicia told me she wanted to introduce you to us. I hope you don't mind, but I did a little digging. What? What does he mean by digging? While I can't exactly puff out my chest and boast about my life, I haven't done anything wrong, and committing a crime is totally out of the question. As I was pondering this, Dad let out an exaggerated sigh. I've heard your family is quite poor. You've even been working part-time jobs to help with the bills, he said. It was the first time anyone had said so bluntly that I was poor. Sure, we aren't rich, but I always thought we lived a typical life. Still, from the perspective of someone from such a prestigious family, I guess my household must seem inferior. Dad continued. I want Alicia to have a life that's more than just average happiness. That's a parent's heart. Someone broke like you is out of the question. I was deeply shocked by those blatant and malicious words. Seeing my reaction, Dad smirked. It was clear as day that he was trying to corner me even more. You only graduated from a night high school and didn't even go to college. What kind of job can a high school grad get? What kind of qualifications can you earn? Becoming a lawyer like me, dream on. I want Alicia to marry a man even more respectable than me. 
you're not even in the running. Alicia looked as stunned by her dad's words and seemed at a loss for what to say. I was so shocked, I couldn't even lift my head. I won't have my daughter marry an undereducated man like you. Are you making a joke by just graduating from a night school? I've heard enough of your sob stories about growing up in a single parent home. Why don't you just scram? You're an eyesore. Dad abruptly stood up and, in his rage, grabbed his teacup and splashed its contents at me. Thankfully, the tea was lukewarm, so I didn't get burned. However, my already fragile pride was now completely shattered. I'm sorry. I somehow managed to utter those words, forcing my trembling legs to carry me out of the room. She didn't come after me. That night, I received an apologetic message from Alicia. She expressed her apologies and mentioned wanting to meet and talk, but I replied that I couldn't see her again. After being berated like that, I didn't feel I could sit down and have a calm conversation with her. My self-esteem was in tatters, and I felt like anything said to me would just make me feel even more insignificant. I couldn't find a way to measure up to her father. Marriage seemed impossible. In the end, we chose to part ways. And then, 10 years flew by. 10 years later, we were both 32. I'm still working at the same law firm. I've gotten my national certification, and the busy days have helped me forget the past. I hadn't been in touch with Alicia since that day. I heard she got a job and moved out of her parents' home. By the third year, she had been transferred out of state. I couldn't bring myself to respond to her messages. Yet, I still can't forget her. I feel I might never be able to love someone else for the rest of my life. Trying to escape those thoughts, I've immersed myself in my work. Matthew, if you are going to the courthouse, could you drop off these documents for me? A senior lawyer called out to me as he was about to leave. Today, I was scheduled to accompany the director to the courthouse. At the request of a senior colleague, I readily agreed and took the car keys. The director is like a second father to me. I've been under his wing since high school, so no matter how hard I try, I can't outshine him. He's always smiling and is a great personality, but I heard from a senior colleague that in his younger days, he was known as the Demon Nash. Even though I've been working here for 10 years, I'm still at the bottom of the pecking order in the office. That's why, when the director goes out, I often accompany him, acting like a secretary. Though it's not really my job anymore. When we arrived at the local court, similar to a county court, I parted ways with the director to deliver some documents a colleague had entrusted me with. These are probably documents for the next trial. Given the rush, today might be the deadline. After submitting the documents, I was heading to the restroom when I spotted a familiar face. I thought I might be mistaken for a moment, but it's a face I couldn't forget. He, seemingly an authority figure, was walking towards me. I tried not to make eye contact and nodded while looking down. But that man, Alicia's father, stopped right in my path. Well, well, aren't you the overconfident guy who proposed to my daughter despite having no college degree? I had hoped he hadn't recognized me, but I was wrong. I remained silent, keeping my head down. What are you doing here? If you're being sued, do you need my help? Someone like you, without an education, probably knows nothing about the law, right? Alicia's father sneered, suddenly changing his expression. It was a look of pure fury, so sudden it sent chills down my spine. You said something to Alicia, didn't you? Ever since that day, she stopped listening to me. She was always such a good, obedient girl, but now it's as if she's under a bad influence. I have no idea what you're talking about. I haven't been in touch with Alicia since then. Your accusations make no sense to me. Oh really? You think you can just brush me off like that? Listen here, low life's like you can't even hold a conversation with sophisticated people like Alicia and me. Know your place and cower in it. Never show your face around me again. That might be a little difficult for you. Out of place, 
A laid-back voice echoed in the area, and the person who appeared was Director Nelson. Oh, Mr. Nelson, why are you here? The one who exclaimed in surprise appeared to be Alicia's father's boss. Shocked, he bent forward in a right angle to greet the director. This is a courtroom, right? Isn't it normal for attorneys like us to be here? The director, laughing, addressed the boss, while Alicia's father looked on in disbelief. Oh, come on, haven't you also served as the president of the Bar Association? You're a giant in the legal community, aren't you? Well, it's just that I've been around long enough to be known by many. Being an attorney, it's only natural to come to a courtroom, right? More importantly, what's up with our Matthew? Director Nelson gave me a light pat on the shoulder and looked towards Alicia's father. His face was smiling, but his eyes weren't. I knew that look all too well, having worked alongside him for many years. When he made that face, it usually meant he was upset. Matthew here is my protege. He's a top-notch lawyer. What? A lawyer? But didn't you only graduate from an evening high school? Alicia's father looked at me with an incredulous expression. I simply nodded in confirmation. That was the case 10 years ago, but thanks to Director Nelson's guidance, I was able to become a lawyer. Did you know even someone with just a high school diploma can become a lawyer? On my suit, there's a liar's badge, but it seems Alicia's father didn't notice. When I broke up with her a decade ago, seeing how devastated I was, Director Nelson had suggested I study to become a lawyer. You don't necessarily need a college degree to become one. It was a challenging path, but I decided to take it on, thanks to Director Nelson's encouragement and rigorous training. Somehow, I passed the preliminary and bar exams on my first try and completed my legal training to become a lawyer. Director Nelson and my colleagues at the firm were all thrilled and celebrated with me. That was five years ago. Matthew has always been exceptional. He passed all his exams on the first go. Since high school, he's been honing his skills with our senior staff here, so he's very hands-on and proactive. I plan on having him as my successor. Hearing Director Nelson's words, I couldn't help but blush. Alicia's father looked at me, clearly taken aback. Oh, by the way, for the upcoming trial, Matthew will be the lead attorney for the plaintiff. I believe you're representing the defendant, aren't you? It'll be interesting to see how this plays out, won't it? Director Nelson said with a sly grin. His villain-like demeanor made me smile too. I've been mentored by this man for over a decade, so there's no way I'm backing down. I'm determined to show I can beat even the best lawyers out there. Seeing our confidence, Alicia's father turned pale. His boss was even trembling. Well, see you around. With that, we left the scene. Since then, it had been a whirlwind of preparations for the trial. This time, it was a divorce case. Although mediation was attempted, the husband, the defendant, wasn't satisfied, taking the case to court. From our side, the main issues were securing the divorce and claiming alimony. The wife, our plaintiff, was resolute in her desire for divorce and had amassed a lot of evidence pointing to infidelity and domestic violence. The contents of the medical report submitted were so shocking that I found myself grimacing and I was determined more than ever to win. On the day of the trial, I reassured the anxious plaintiff, don't worry, you're not fighting this battle alone. But, of course, I'm not fighting this alone either. I'm always being helped by my colleagues and staff at the office. That's why I truly believe there are people standing behind me, supporting me. Isn't it the same for you? You've mentioned that your kids, your parents, and even your friends are all cheering you on, haven't you? Let's give it our best shot, together. Yes. And so, we took on the case and came out overwhelmingly victorious. The husband's arguments were all over the place, lacking any sincerity. Using that to our advantage, we were able to win the desired alimony of $30,000. Of course, the wife was granted custody. Child support was set at $1,000 monthly, and a lump sum payment was agreed upon until the child reaches adulthood. 
everything went as we hoped. After hearing the verdict, the defendant hung his head in dismay. It seemed like Alicia's father was suggesting an appeal, but not wanting to endure any more humiliation. The trial was concluded then and there. Hey, someone called out as we were leaving the courthouse. I knew there was only one person who would call out like that in such a high-handed manner. And sure enough, it was Alicia's father, glaring at me. Don't get too cocky, so what if you're a lawyer? Without a proper education, you're never going to make it big. I won't have someone without a degree acting all high and mighty. I admit I don't have the educational background, but is that really necessary to defend someone? What? I became a lawyer to stand up for the weak. I don't care about climbing the corporate ladder. I can't stand people who oppress those in a vulnerable position, and I certainly won't tolerate those who misuse the power they're entrusted with. Humph, young blood, that's just idealistic nonsense. Maybe, but it's something I believe a lawyer should never forget. You insolent man, I can't even deal with you. With that, Alicia's father stormed off. To suffer such a defeat after looking down on his opponent must have been a huge blow to his pride. Reflecting on it, I felt a bit vindicated about my past decisions. A few days later, an unexpected visitor arrived at the office. Alicia, it's been a while. Alicia, still as beautiful as ever, smiled, though she appeared a bit worn out. Alicia came to discuss something about her parents. The clerk who heard the conversation informed me of this. About her parents. When I asked that, Alicia, with tearful eyes, pulled out a few photographs. In them was Alicia's father. The man in the pictures was seen getting intimate with a woman other than Alicia's mother. There were multiple photos, all with different settings and outfits, suggesting potential evidence of infidelity. My dad used to dote on me and my mom, almost smotheringly, treated us like birds in a cage. I only realized something was off about 10 years ago. Up until then, I thought it was normal, but something happened that made me realize his thinking was twisted, and I left home. But it seems like over these 10 years, with me gone, my mom has been even more controlled by him. She rarely leaves the house and spends her days being berated by him at home. She used to love going out. But now, she's afraid of upsetting him. Can't we get them divorced? At this rate, my mom will break. Saying this, Alicia became too emotional and began sobbing into her handkerchief. I'm sorry, but without the person directly involved, please, can't something be done? At the clerk's words, Alicia kept bowing her head. In matters of divorce, the person's intent is paramount, and there's limited room for family to intervene. But considering the circumstances, I wanted to help. It's not just because of Alicia, but it's also sort of a professional ethic of mine as an attorney. Can we get your mom on the phone? At my words, Alicia quickly looked up. Her eyes, now bloodshot, widened, and she hurriedly pulled out her cell phone. I can, right now. All right then, please go ahead. She then set her phone to speaker mode and I listened to her mom's voice. The voice, in stark contrast to my memory from 10 years ago, sounded utterly drained. Divorce, I haven't thought about that. Thank you for your concern. But mom, you see how dad's behavior is off, right? That's not love, it's just control. I know you've protected me from dad. I know you held him back when I left home. I promise, I'll protect you now. So please, can we run away together? From the other end of the phone, it sounded like Alicia's mother was crying. All I could hear were her sobs, so I spoke up. I'm Matthew, an attorney. Divorce is extremely challenging. I can't necessarily recommend it. If your husband changes his ways, that would be best. There's no way that's gonna happen, Alicia exclaimed. I agree, that person probably won't change their deeply ingrained opinions after all these years. However, if you truly want to run away, it's a different story. If you're too frightened to speak up because of your husband, let me handle it. That's what lawyers are for. I felt Alicia's gaze on me. On the other end of the phone, Alicia's mom gave a small yes. 
Jess, thank you. With that, I was decided as her representative. Immediately, I had Alicia and her mom evacuate to a hotel out of state because we didn't know what kind of treatment we'd receive again. I promptly sent a certified letter to Alicia's dad, proposing divorce negotiations. Of course, it included the evidence of infidelity that Alicia had brought. Probably right after he got it, Alicia's father called, furious. What's the meaning of this? Is this some kind of revenge? What have you done? Where are they? This isn't revenge. I've been officially asked by your wife. Those photos were prepared by your daughter. They both don't want to see you anymore. So I made the proposal as a representative. This is a marital issue. We'll settle it between us. You know that's not possible, right? You're a lawyer after all. Then, it's court. We'll settle this in court. That's fine with you. What? You're a respected lawyer. What will happen if your affair and domestic abuse become public? Your reputation will hit rock bottom, right? We have the evidence. Despite this, you still don't want to discuss a divorce settlement. Ick. You'd think a lawyer would consider that, but Alicia's father seemed really heated. I'll ask again. Do you want to go to court? To my slow question, a small understood came from the other end of the phone. After that, our demands were almost unconditionally met, and Alicia's parents were able to divorce. Though it wasn't made public, there's no smoke without fire, as they say. Alicia's father's affair was exposed in a weekly magazine, and his divorce became public, leading him to lose his influence bit by bit. He was fired from the firm he belonged to and apparently tried to start his own, but it seems it's not going so well. Well, in a profession where trust is everything, you can only say he brought it on himself. Then, I started dating Alicia again. She sincerely apologized for something that happened 10 years ago. We decided to rebuild our relationship from a friendship, but I was so touched by her kindness and positivity that I asked her out. Fast forward a year. We were both staring at a piece of paper. This is the most nervous I've ever been. It's okay. I got us three copies, just in case. As I shook from nerves, Alicia pulled out another copy of the same paper that was on the desk. It was a marriage registration form. After all the twists and turns, we decided to get married. I couldn't forget about Alicia for those 10 years, and apparently, she felt the same about me. We're both getting on in years, so we decided to make it official sooner rather than later. For our witnesses, we chose the owner of the cafe where we met and Director Nelson. Once it's submitted, we'll officially be a family. Are you sure you want to live with my mom? Alicia asked. We decided to live with her mother. She's slowly been regaining her health since then, but we felt we couldn't leave her alone given her occasional bouts of instability. She's your beloved mom, right? She's just as important to me. Thanks. Don't worry about my family. I've got siblings, and my mom says she's enjoying her life on her own. My mother, who used to be frail, is now in high spirits, going on solo trips and joining local choirs. My brother and sister each have their own families and are living happily. Suddenly, I looked up at the sky. It was a clear day with not a cloud in sight. Being able to submit our marriage registration on such a day, I feel truly blessed. I'm so happy. I couldn't help but voice my feelings. I used to struggle just to get by and couldn't really feel happiness, but now I have the person I love right by my side. Everyone around me lives with smiles on their faces, making those tough days seem like a lie. Back then, when Alicia's father scolded me harshly and threw his tea at me, I felt so humiliated and sad, but in a way, I think that experience led me to the life I have now. If I hadn't been so put down then, I might never have aimed to become a lawyer. I might not have put in the effort to get to where I am now. Maybe, in a way, I could even think of him as a benefactor. But still, I can never forgive what he did. You can't always say hard work pays off, 
but I can definitely say I'm glad I worked hard back then. It might be hindsight, but I'm happy now. Beside me, my girlfriend laughs. I smile back at her and tightly squeeze her hand. That day, when I got up in the morning, my head was pounding from a hangover. So, I took the morning off from work. It was no big deal, the kind of laid-back company where I worked. The West New York East branch of a listed company that deals in leasing and selling office equipment. Whether it's located in the West or the East, it's confusing, but internally it was sarcastically referred to as the tax avoidance branch. That means, from my point of view, this branch exists solely to account for expenses like labor costs for the company's overall revenue. There were absolutely no expectations for the branch itself to generate revenue. Even if there were, it would be a problem. The six employees, including the secretary, were all admittedly lazy, constantly skipping work. When I got to the office, I headed straight to the smoking room. There, the branch manager and two senior employees were smoking and chatting. I joined in. Is it true that this branch will be shut down by the next financial statement? Really, you're kidding. As I was surprised, Sam, who was nearing retirement, exhaled cigarette smoke and said, that rumor's around all the time, right? Well, yay, but that's not good at all. Those rumors affect our reputation. Everyone else burst into laughter at the manager's words. As if we in this branch had something like a reputation to worry about. Then, the secretary came stomping in, letting the branch manager know there was a call from the headquarters. This secretary, although she doesn't smoke herself, didn't mind other people smoking. It would be one thing if there were young female employees who minded the smell of smoke, but besides the secretary, all the employees were men, and all were smokers. It seems to me that the office could just allow smoking, but apparently, the law was strict. The branch manager extinguished his cigarette and went to the office, and we followed him. He was making a troubled face while taking a call from headquarters. After ending the call, he slumped into his chair and, slapping his cheeks with both hands, said, This is not good. We're in trouble, and turn to us. Apparently, for one week starting next week, a female employee from headquarters, who directly reports to the CEO, will be coming to our branch for training. And this female employee is none other than the CEO's daughter. She's young, the CEO's daughter. Maybe 25 or 26. Hearing that, we men were buzz. We looked at each of her's faces and grinned, stretching our noses. Steve, I need you to take care of her. I was tasked by the branch manager to be the guardian of the daughter. Though my heart leaped at the prospect of being around the young CEO's daughter, I was also half worried. Why on earth would she want to come to a place like this for training? To learn how to slack off at work. It just didn't sit right with me. The first day the CEO's daughter arrived. Normally, the employees' faces, which seldom all appeared even after the start time, were lined up 15 minutes early on this day. Everyone was restless and uneasy, spraying deodorant on their suits, swishing mouthwash in the restroom sink, and frantically trying to get rid of the smell of cigarette smoke. My name's Sarah, I'll be with you for a week. Sarah quickly bowed her head, her chestnut-colored long hair tied up. Her sweet scent of shampoo wafted. She was quite a beauty, with large double-lidded eyes and a youthful allure in the air. I felt the strength of will in the way she stared at me. I'll be taking care of the training. My name's Steve. I'm the one who is bothering you for training. Please drop the formalities. The daughter seemed more feisty than I thought she would be. As I began explaining to Sarah about the sales area of our branch and the current customers, the branch manager, followed by Sam, and then the other two men, as if they'd arranged it, got up and slowly headed to the smoking room along the wall. Even the non-smoking secretary followed after them. 
I really wanted a cigarette too, but I held back and continued to attend to Sarah. In the afternoon, I drove Sarah around to visit customers in the company car. Sarah, possibly nervous, kept her lips sealed and stared straight ahead. You don't need to be so tense. These are our regular customers. My words were met with a slight nod from Sarah, still facing forward. I hope the car doesn't smell like cigarettes. I sniffed around, only to smell Sarah's sweet shampoo, not cigarettes. I glanced at Sarah and saw her kneecaps peeking out from her skirt. I was taken aback. Focus, focus on driving. Hello there, Brown Office Equipment. Here for your regular inspection. The first place I took Sarah was a longtime client, where we leased multifunctional copier. A familiar lady greeted us, sarcastically saying, You didn't come last month either. This is not a regular inspection, it's an irregular one. I thought our slacking off had been discovered and quickly glanced at Sarah's expression. She was staring emotionlessly ahead. On the second and third day too, I drove Sarah in the company car, taking her on token sales routes and regular inspections. And on the fourth day, we're a little early, but how about lunch? There's a great burger restaurant ahead. Sarah answered, yes, but looked somewhat dissatisfied. Perhaps this young lady doesn't eat burgers. Sarah and I sat side by side at the counter of the restaurant. While waiting for the burgers, I searched for a conversation topic, feeling the awkward silence. When in doubt, talk about the weather. The weather's good today, isn't it? It's cloudy, though. The atmosphere became even more awkward. Then, can I ask you something? Don't you do any door-to-door -door sales? Sarah asked me. Waving my hand in front of my face, I said, rarely, it's usually a waste of time. But isn't it great in sales if you get one deal out of 10 attempts? Well, people say that, but it's a hassle, isn't it? It's best to handle work safely without any highs or lows. Sarah reacted to my casual remark, giving me a sharp glare. I looked away, and just then the burgers were served. Nice timing. I picked up my burger and bit into it. However, while we were driving after lunch, Sarah brought up the conversation again. Without any highs or lows means neither good nor bad, right? What does handling work safely mean? Does it mean doing nothing? Her words were sharp. I wondered what had rubbed her the wrong way. Is your job really that fun? That's impressive. Are you satisfied every day? To me, that kind of life is the worst. I was also ticked off by that. I pulled the car over to the side of the road and stopped. You have no business judging my life. After all, you're the CEO's daughter. You must be enjoying a splendid life, I said. After saying that, I realized I had gone too far. But I had been frustrated by having to look after Sarah day after day. Even though I had gotten carried away, I felt like I had let it all out and felt refreshed. Suddenly, Sarah covered her face with both hands and began to cry out loud. Making a woman cry in the car if someone passing by saw it, there's no telling what they would think. I looked around in a panic. Hey, I went too far, I'm sorry. Then an unexpected response came from Sarah. Daughter, daughter, the CEO's daughter. Everyone says it, but I'm a human being too. I still don't know anything about the world. Sarah choked on her words at that point. I bought bottles of water at a gas station and returned to where Sarah was sitting in front of the park's fountain. I made you slack off because of me, said Sarah. It's the usual thing, slacking off. Oh, I might get scolded again. When I handed her the water bottle, Sarah bowed her head slightly. I graduated from college four years ago and joined my father's company, she said. Sarah had tried job hunting but hadn't received the offers she hoped for. Her father told her if she wanted to work, she could work at his company. 
My father said that since I'm a woman, any job would do. It's just a seat warmer until I get married. That's what he told me. That was truly old-fashioned thinking. I had only known him from the company's entrance ceremony and a few speeches he gave throughout the year, but I hadn't realized he fought that way. Sure, the company brochure had a picture of the smiling CEO with the words, we support women in their careers, but still. My title as the CEO's assistant is just a fancy title, but there's a separate secretary and there's no real work for me. Sarah even went so far as to say that her current situation was akin to being kept in a gilded cage. Then, about 10 days ago, she spoke her mind to her father. Her father, who is the CEO, replied that only a small number of people are doing what they love. Most are doing jobs they don't want to do for the sake of money or living. My father said, if you think it's a lie, you can look at our tax avoidance branch, he said. That would be our West New York East branch. According to Sarah, the employees at the West New York East branch, including me, are considered to be useless dropouts who are good for nothing but tax avoidance. I couldn't believe what my father said, so I wanted to see for myself. So I came to watch you all work under the guise of training, she said. And sure enough, as her father had said, we were lazy people without a hint of passion or motivation for our work. That night, I was thinking back to what Sarah had confided in me during the day. Some adults often ask silly questions like, what do you want to be when you grow up, or what's your dream for the future, to small children. I had always felt uncomfortable with such questions. I also hated the phrase of dreams come true. What you want to be in the future is not a dream, but a goal. And the goal is not something that just happens. It's something you make happen yourself. I thought about that and reflected on my current self. Dream, goal. I seem to have left both behind a long time ago. I had heard another serious talk from Sarah the day before. Our West New York East branch was really going to be shut down this time. I told everyone while puffing on a cigarette in the smoking room. So, we're getting fired. Well, I don't know about that. I answered my co-worker's question. But even if we get transferred somewhere else, we still have to work properly. My manager potted the sign co-worker on his shoulder and said, Don't say that now. Sarah's last day of training. Headquarters has a project they want to know if we can get a contract for. Several sales attempts were made, but we were totally ignored. So, we'd given up and left it alone. I somehow thought of taking Sarah to that sales there. Yes, definitely. Sarah, with wide, round eyes, nodded vigorously. Oh, it's you. The client looked at me with a disgusted face. You only show up when we've forgotten about you, and you ignore our inquiries. I'm very sorry. I bowed deeply, and Sarah bowed with me. Who is this? I apologize for the delay. My name is Sarah, and I'm in training. Sarah handed over her business card, and the client stared at it intently. Your name is Sarah. Sarah nodded slightly, her face downcast. She's the CEO's daughter. The client's attitude changed dramatically at the appearance of the CEO's daughter herself. I opened the materials I brought, and Sarah enthusiastically explained them. Seeing Sarah's fervor, I felt my own heart warm. And at last, we secured a major lease contract with them. That evening, we had Sarah's farewell party, doubling as a celebration for the big contract at our favorite bar. Everyone ordered their favorite food and drinks, and the alcohol was flowing nicely. But she's really something, the CEO's daughter, closing a deal on her first visit, one we've been trying to get forever. Sarah bashfully looked down. But I was angry at the manager's insincere but harmless words. That's not correct. I raised my voice involuntarily. Everyone looked at me with question marks above their heads. Well, sure, 
It might have helped that Sarah was the CEO's daughter, but her presentation was excellent. That's why we got this job. I was passionately defending my stance, and everyone was watching me, still with question marks. I chugged the last of the whiskey and soda left in my mug and gulped. The next day, she came to say thanks for taking care of her for the week. Steve, I said some rude things to you. No, it's my fault. I bowed to her as she left, then quickly ran after her. I told her that from now on, I would break away from merely going through the motions at work. I am going to live, really live here. I'll be pushing sales hard. She nodded at me vigorously and smiled faintly. It's been fun this past week. Meeting you, Steve, is something I'll never forget. What a turn of events. Our branch in West New York East, which was not just rumored to be closed, but actually slated for it, was to continue. It's all thanks to my performance, right? I said, puffing out a cloud of cigarette smoke. Then, Sam slapped me on the head, saying, you fool. In fact, my aggressive sales tactics had caused the branch's sales to skyrocket. That's when the branch manager chimed in. You know, the CEO's daughter apparently pleaded with the CEO directly. It's too valuable a branch to close down, she said. A little while later, I was loafing in a coffee shop smoking room, smoking a cigarette between outdoor rounds. Is it okay? Loafing again. The one who sat down in front of me was her. I stubbed out the cigarette in the ashtray and waved away the lingering smoke. It's a break, a break. Don't make it sound so bad. I said, and she grinned. Sarah, why are you here? Oh, this is the first time someone has called me by my first name. Is it? She had quit her job, defying her father's wishes, and had moved out to live alone in a studio apartment, working part-time at a convenience store while job hunting. I called after her as she stood to leave, saying it was a coincidence. How about, once you get a job, we can go to a fancy and delicious restaurant to celebrate? At my invitation, she puffed out her cheeks in mock anger. A job celebration, is that all? I froze in surprise, and she smiled warmly. Then she waved goodbye, and I watched her walk away with a brisk step. How did you like it? Subscribing to the channel will encourage production. See you in the next video.